Welcome. This is Steve Viachica, and I started going to ISPI conferences in 1989. For as long as I've been going, Lynn has been presenting and making graphic recordings of the conference events. You can see her work on the ISPI website and in other venues. I was lucky enough to work with Lynn when she made graphic recordings of Boise State's two skill summits. Today, Lynn is here to preview her ISPI Master Series presentation on visual storytelling. During her time with us, she'll describe what it is, why performance improvement practitioners should use it, and she'll show us how to use the components of a graphic alphabet. She's also reserved time to answer your questions. Lynn, we're delighted to have you with us today. Run through this an initial time with a group of colleagues before I stand up in the big tent. Uh, so let me turn on my timing device too, because planned timing and actual timing are always two different things. Indeed. So I'm going to tell you about what I know about what visual storytelling, something that I've been doing as a performance technologist the last 30 or 40 years. A number of years ago, when Roger Addison and Carol Haig and I were teaching the HPT Institute uh, Principles and Practices at the conference, Gary Harmler cornered us and said, you should write a book. We need one that tells all the stories that you tell in workshops. It helps people understand how performance improvement really works. And you should put in some of those pictures, too. They help people get it. So he invited us to his office in Tucson to discuss it. Then he locked us in until we produced an outline for the book. Well, it's the book that many of you know as Performance Architecture. It's recently been travel, um, sorry, translated into Chinese. I can speak Chinese, but not English, obviously. Um, we get frequent feedback from users that the stories and visuals help them to understand the ideas of the book. So have you ever thought that visuals are great, but sometimes they're distracting, and it's really hard to find the right clip art? Or I like stories, but I'm not sure how to use them in my work. We're here to tackle those issues. So first, uh, over the next hour and a half, I'm going to clarify what I mean by visual storytelling, show how you can use it with many examples, uh, how to use it in our work, I mean, and uh, say a few things about what research says about the effectiveness of visuals and stories. At the end, I'll introduce you to No Talent Drawing, which if you're already someone who draws, you probably don't need, but many people worry that they can't draw a straight line. Let me assure you, you don't need a straight line uh, in order to get ideas across. Um, also give you a job aid to help choose what kind of story to use based on your content and um, a worksheet for starting to plan how to make a storyboard to support the story you want to tell. I'm going to pause two times for questions, and uh, Steve will manage that part. So, what do I mean by visual? It's anything you can look at. It doesn't have to be a picture or a video. It could be anything on this list, and you can probably think of more, like dance. Um, words can be visuals, especially if they're just a few of keywords that uh, together with other visual em, um, visual elements form what I call uh, an eye bite. So you look at it, go, yep, got it, and look at the next piece. You'll note the example up there, up here on the slide, has no pictures. It includes a geometric shapes, colors, letters, numbers, treated as shapes, but it's missing something to make it meaningful, a story. So a story does not have to be once upon a time. It doesn't have to be a hero's journey. It could be any of the things listed up here. It's a narrative that leads to a conclusion. 
a single photo or painting can tell a story. For example, a picture of a mother in a war zone holding a starving child, something we've seen too much of recently. The pictures on this slide are the story of how one organization gets new business. Um, they, you'll see there are not very many words here, but the pictures help make it clear. So a visual story is any story with a visual component like this. The visual gets people's attention. The story engages them so that they keep paying attention. And the visual and the story together help people to understand and remember what you're trying to get across. Now, there's a lot of ways we can use visual stories in our work. So I'm going to introduce each of these and show you examples. Most of the examples are going to be my work. A few will be others. But I can't always get permission to use other people's visuals. So that's why most of it's mine. Uh, sometimes I will suggest others work to investigate. So uh, use them to teach concepts. <clears throat> Visual stories help explain unfamiliar uh, concepts or to clarify ones that are misunderstood. You'll notice that uh, religion uses many stories and often accompanies them with painting, sculpture, or dance. And that's, most religions do this. Uh, you've probably run into Aesop's fables as a child. And when you saw them the first time, they were probably accompanied by charming illustrations like this that help make it clear why a long-billed store can't eat out of a flat plate. Uh, there's a lot of marketing messages use this principle. I think the visual explanations are seriously underused in our field. Uh, now, here are some examples uh, that I'm about to show of uh, some hard to get across concepts in our field. Okay, so here is a bunch of pictures of ways that people acquire skills and knowledge at present. I made, wrote them for a colleague of mine who had a client organization um, and she wanted to introduce them to having more than just training as tools in their box. But first she needed to help them see that classroom learning or e-learning were not the only way to deliver skills and knowledge. With, together with this visual, um, she was able to tell stories to her client about what she'd seen their employees doing. And they got it. And what's more, they remembered it and asked for a copy of the visual. Here are some concepts in our field. Uh, in, the perform in the Principles and Practices Institute, uh, we find that people struggle to grasp the idea of performance. They tend to think that it's activity like answering phone or uh, keying data into a screen. Um, our field took a huge leap forward 30 years ago when Gilbert shifted the focus from activity to results. If what the organization is looking for is the customer's question answered in the first, the first round, or the complaint resolved right out of the bat, or data entered correctly so that it doesn't have to be corrected and rekeyed, then you've got results. Um, so the first drawing in the upper left uh, is our definition of performance. It's activity plus results. And the drawing on the right expands that definition onto how do you improve performance. It's by lowering the cost of activity or increasing the value of the result, or both. So banks improve performance with ATMs. When they lowered the costs, the labor costs, and they increased the value to us as customers, being able to get hold of our money anytime. 
and they improved it again when they established online banking. Now notice I am telling you a story about how we define performance, and this visual illustrates it. Teaching concepts uh, are a major purpose for, uh, are a major application for visual stories. Now, sometimes if uh, your lesson is going to be distributed to a wide audience and for a well-funded organization, it's practical to build a standalone video with, um, with extensive planning, script writing, editing, filming, etc., though it's not really necessary. Now, here is a really great example from um, Anime RSA. This is on YouTube, and I have, I have put this in your handouts. Um, let me back up. You have a handout. On the front page of the handout is a link to all these slides on my Dropbox. Um, the, the slide package is too big for me to have emailed. Um, the, on the front of the slides, there, um, I'm sorry, on this page of the slides, there is a link to the video on YouTube. And it's worth watching. It's very well done. And it's, it shows how visual stories can make a concept, a difficult concept that actually contradicts what people believe, clear and memorable. So I'm going to move on to tasks. <clears throat> now, often a task is pretty straightforward, and people can learn the task with just a little demonstration and practice. But if it's complex and involves interaction with other people, it can be hard to get all the pieces in sequence or understand how they relate. In some cases, it's, uh, the task is an annoyance or burdensome to learn. Uh, for example, um, safety regulations and, um, and uh, compliance regulations. You need, a, if you want to get people to understand and remember it, you need a more compelling reason than to just uh, try to persuade them that it's important. And visual stories can be very helpful. Here is an example. Now, I do not expect you to read all of this. I just want to show you what this looks like. This is a complex task. It shows the story of a transaction. Again, this was a colleague of mine who was brought in to, um, to an organization that needed to show, uh, needed people to learn a sales process, which is represented by the orange arrows across the top of the page. But they also needed to know, understand how the task loops, the sub loops of jobs that had to be done before each step could be completed. And so this helps, uh, this helps orient the learner and helps them see how all the pieces fit into the whole. This can be posted so that it's reviewable in the classroom or online. The person can click on it and look, again, as they learn all the technical pieces. Um, now, if a class is not, if a task is non-sequential, um, like handling an irate customer or counseling an employee, it's often best to tell, to put the story in the form of a you do the story setup, you put the learner into the situation and require them to act. Often you give them a range of possible choices they can make. Um, there is a fellow named uh, Dr. Ray Jimenez who has a, uh, a, a website called Vignettes Learning. Um, that does a really good job of showing how to do this, uh, put together a good scenario on a shoestring. Now, sometimes when the task is particularly in, 
um, intimidating or burdensome, consider a comic book. Um, something with heroes, drastic problems, dramatic solutions, and lots of action. Like um, one of the best examples I saw was a guy who came to, uh, who made a presentation at ISPI quite a few years back, back when we used overheads. Uh, he had hired a comic book artist to come in. He was the safety trainer for a manufacturing organization. And he had the guy help him develop some SWAT team comics um, where there were appealing characters um, who had to deal with industrial accidents, runaway uh, forklifts, leaking chemical barrels, death by electrocution, and so on. It captured people's so imitation and made it real. Um, this particular one is a real example that you can download from the web. Again, this is in the slides with the link. Um, this unpacks fair use law. And since all of us need to use, need to develop materials that contain pictures, video clips, music, other media that we may not have a lot of budget for, um, for creating original material, uh, it really pays to know what you can use and when. And that's what this book does. And it does it in comic book form. It's very clear and entertaining. So I recommend you download it. It's free. Okay. I'd like to know if you've got any questions so far. Yes, uh, I have a question. I'm curious about how you got your start in visual storytelling. Um, I was one of those kids who always drew. And um, if somebody asked me, what's this? I could always tell them. Um, so I view myself as someone who knows how to uh, who knows how to create images? I've learned something about the research behind it, but I always just told stories. I never thought of them together, but I realized when I was asked to put together this presentation that I've been a storyteller all my life. So I've been researching like mad to find out what the research has to say about the efficacy of storytelling. So the real tr thing is every kid is a storyteller. Uh, the thing is to get it reined in, and we'll get a, we'll have some job aids toward the end and help with that. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? No other questions at this time. Okay. With using visual stories, which is the pictures and the words, you can work in both directions. I will often have a client tell me the story of how a task is done or a process is done, but who does what, what they do, what they say, uh, what changes hands, et cetera, while I sketch it out. And believe me, it's very rough. What I've been showing you are very simple graphics, but, but they're hand-drawn, quick sketches. These are really quick and messy sketches when I'm interviewing the client. It lets me capture more information than doing a flow chart like you're seeing on the screen. The, the flow chart on the screen is something you can create later. It's very useful when you're trying to um, replan um, the processes, re-engineer processes. Um, but Capturing the detail with the stories and the dialogue are really give you a much better idea of what's going on. Now, that said, people are really not very good at reading a flowchart like this and actually seeing what it says. I picked a fairly simple one here. Um, but once your, um, once your flowchart has been redesigned, um, or even if you're just flowcharting the as is, 
you can turn it into a visual story so that people see what is going on. And here is an example uh, from my own experience. I was on a team to redesign the organization and the workflows of a railroad accounting department. Once we had the new flows approved, um, we had to train the accountants and clerks and bookkeepers and so on on how those new flows worked. So I, I turned key parts of the, of the flows into pictures for overviews. Um, this is, again, a cross-functional flow. So you can see the various functions down the left-hand side. And then time sort of moves along to the right. And I just took those box, turned those boxes and diamond shapes into pictures of what people were actually doing. And you can see they're pretty quick. They're not really detailed. Uh, now, this, these kind of charts were kind of unusual. So we ran them by the same executives who had, who had approved the redesigned workflows to see if they were okay with this approach. They looked at them and they said, oh, is that what we're doing? proving once again that people who do a sign-off on material you hand over do not, have not necessarily understood what you thought you communicated. Ever since, I, I didn't draw these picture flowcharts before, but I've done them ever since. And now I'm reasonably confident that the approver knows what they're looking for. Um, often I, I work with colleagues who've uh, found a, a large and messy chunk of work and need someone to help bring visual clarity to it all. So this client, um, uh, this colleague was working with a client that brokered rooftop power systems. So that's where you put, you know, all the um, the cells on some can't think of it, solar cells displays on a rooftop and then channel the power off. Um, so it was a, a complex task. It involved three jobs, um, both uh, sourcing the work on the internet, uh, dealing with the customer, dealing with vendors, doing installation and so on. Uh, three jobs, and it all had to be seamless to the customer. So she was asked to develop training that would shorten the learning curve and to smooth the handoffs between those three jobs, again, so that it was seamless to the customers and they weren't getting different stories. She recognized that the core issues were people needed to understand how the pieces fit together and how they impacted the other two jobs. You needed to show the whole story. So I came in and worked with her subject matter experts. I caught all this information on sticky notes first because I didn't have them for long and I had to work really fast. Um, this picture is just one small part of one of the three jobs. Once we had all of these, you see they were done on flip chart paper and we put them up in front of the SMEs to validate them as correct. And then I translated them into a visual story of the sale. And you will probably recognize the top row there. That's part. Uh, the one I showed you before was part of this job. So there are the three jobs across the top, the frontline specialist, the advisor consultant, and the partner slash vendor. Um, it takes the first query, again, along through the top, through actual installation and payment. Uh, I ran out of room in the classroom, and so I had to make the orange arrows go down to have enough space to get it all in there. We posted it in the classroom, and as training progressed, the trainer could keep showing people where they were in the overall process. It was a lot easier for people to understand where they were going on, where they were, because they used to get lost in those sub loops and wonder how it related to the whole thing. Oh my God, 
aren't we done yet? Um, an unexpected benefit of doing this was it was in um, the experienced employees. Well, as you can see from the picture, this is not a high-end classroom. It's a pretty typical classroom. It was a worked over an emptied out storeroom with a bunch of desks and chairs shoved in there and some wall, uh, wall board nailed up. And uh, it was right adjacent to the work area. So the experienced employees could come in when the class wasn't in, in, uh, in progress and check out the chart. And they really enjoyed it. They loved looking at the cartoons of their own work. And they also started discussing it and recommending process improvements because they could really see how it all was supposed to hang together. And by the way, those stars you see, we went back in and we added stars to each step that represented a follow-up opportunity for the salespeople. Now, you can do this sort of thing without drawing at all. You can use photos, headshots of the players. You can use icons and arrows to show the paper, the computer, the, the iPhone, etc. And uh, you can cut them all out, lay them out on a long piece of paper or out across the top of a wall. And it makes it so much more helpful and so much clearer to people when you've got a complicated thing that takes them a week or more to learn. Okay, so there's also introducing initiatives. All of us struggle to help introduce initiatives at some point. The hardest part often is to give a picture that's clear and credible about why it's needed, raising it above the flavor of the month uh, assumption that employees often um, assume. Another challenge is to show what are the major parts of the initiative and how do they fit together and how do they relate to the organization's purpose and goals. So here's an example of an actual one. Now again, I don't want you to get eye strained by trying to read all these little uh, pictures. I want you to just so to get the overall picture as I talk through this. Okay, so they were trying to introduce talent management as an organization-wide initiative. And the manager who was responsible for the initiative and for winning hearts and minds was having trouble getting anyone uh, from the mid-level executives to the frontline employees to pay attention. Um, in talks with them, he focused mainly on the five components of the initiative and tried to persuade listeners of their importance. So to make it feel more relevant and engaging for them, we turned it into a road story. Um, we made his three audiences, the executives, managers, and employees, and you see them there at the upper left. There are three people on the path. Uh, we made them the heroes of the story. We showed it as a journey taking place in the competitive landscape. So along the top is the landscape, and this is the business case for talent management as uh, increased competition for both customers and for skilled employees. So the three stories, the three heroes start their journey on the left by stating a current pain point or their group. They then follow a path around from the left where the journey begins down through several challenges in the lower part of the map and finally up to the right where they've achieved their goal. Each of the five components of the initiative is shown as a way station on the journey. So those colored circles um, each uh, with a billboard giving the title of that component. In each, the heroes express a real problem from their own perspective 
And then a member of talent management, labeled TM, pops up with a solution to that problem, which happens to be a part of that component. The journey map ends in the upper right with the three heroes expressing satisfaction with one major improvement in their lives at work. Now, while doing interviews um, for this project, I quickly realized that most organization members had no clue what talent management was. So we end and we added that picture diagram in the center, the wheel or mandala, which provides a visual explanation of what are the components of talent management, from workforce planning through job design, et cetera. So in orientation, um, many people are introduced to their organization uh, with a video, to the organization and its culture with a video. The most successful of these address the higher purpose of the organization, which talks about the founders' aspirations, their struggles and triumphs, and how the organization still addresses that higher purpose. There's uh, Professor Paul Zak from Claremont Graduate University um, found in his research that people are much more motivated by the transcendent purpose of the organization, how it improves lives, than by the transactional purpose, which is the goods and services that it delivers. I'll talk more about that later. Now, here's another example. Um, I worked with a, an NGO, a, an international service organization that wanted to increase the number of, uh, of its host country nationals who were supervisors and managers in its international offices. Um, they're, they felt it reflected poorly on them to import American managers and supervisors into places like Africa, the Middle East, India, and so on. So they wanted to increase the management skills of those people. So they built a week-long management development program. Now, a service organization, it, it is really critical that people have a desire to serve, a really strong desire to serve, even in difficult and sometimes dangerous situations. It's critically important that they have a sense of community and mutual respect because they're going to need to support each other across different countries and different cultures, in, even in parts of the world where with escalating conflicts. So to underscore the culture of service and dedication and to build a community, they devoted the entire first day to storytelling. It started in a darkened theater where stories they'd collected from their own members who worked in different difficult places um, had dealt with gnarly problems. I sat in the darkened theater with a notebook in my lap and a sketchbook in my lap and recorded these stories, which is what you're seeing here. The rest of the day, Participants uh, were put into small groups in sort of semi-structured situations where they were asked to tell their own service stories and then to report the most inspiring of these out to the large group. And I recorded those also. And um, then uh, produced copies of them that could be sent uh, out to, are given out to all of them at the end of the day. By the end of the day, 40 strangers from over 20 countries had developed into a mutually supported community, at least for the time being, um, and probably ongoing. Now, to bring support for an event like this, um, there are two things. 
pick up on uh, Steve's question that you can help that can help you develop skills if you want to do this yourself. Use sketch noting. There's a man named Mike Rohde, R H O D E, who has written a book called Sketch Noting. You can find it on Amazon. And it's really a very good primer on how to do this well and comfortably. Or you can find a graphic recorder to uh, somebody who does this um, or do it yourself. As the man I learned from said when people would say to him, oh, David, if only I had your talent, he would say, this job is about 3% talent and 97% guts. It's mainly just standing up there and doing it. But if you want to find a graphic recorder who's already skilled at doing this, Google graphic recorder and it will take you to many. Okay, still at the line of communicating culture, here is a visual tool from an organization called The Grove. Now I've just thrown up a small thumbnail here um, and we'll talk about what this does. This is a template, um, and many of those words are there, are not there on the template. This is a picture of a, a PowerPoint slide um, that has replaceable text in it. Um, this lets you lay out the history of an organization to tell its story. Um, the visual layout along the left side, it has um, where to put each kind of information that comes out in an organization's story, starting with the, um, the key ideas and results and moving to strategies and initiatives, and then the lower down to key events. And then it puts solid things like people, buildings and products on the ground level. So this, um, these can be produced in table size um, so that people could work on it on the um, with independently with felt pens, or you can have a big wall sized one and fill it out as the story is told, or you could actually fill one out beforehand and use it as a presentation tool during orientation. The wall templates are four feet high and eight feet long. Um, you can use it to engage a group to look back, to understand where they are today by looking at where they came from. And I have often seen it used as groundwork before developing strategy. And as I mentioned, you can use it to fill in to bring new people on board. Use it as kind of a chalk talk. Um, so the again, in your handout, in the set of slides, there's a link to where you can go to the uh, Grove's uh, website and see the tool. And uh, I believe they still have little um, um, little thumbnail videos showing how they're filled out. Now we often. Uh, in our line of work, we often need to draw people out, our clients, learners, organization members, to tell us about their work, their problems, their selves, their goals. And that's not always easy, especially in public. So visual tools can really help to draw out their thoughts, experiences, and stories. Here is an example of picture cards, picture sort cards. This particular set is by Tiagi and Glenn Hughes, who are um, ISBI members. Um, ever, they put a pile of the, you put a pile of these picture cards out in the middle of a table. Everyone in the group is invited to pick one that represents to them in some way a problem they're wrestling with or their journey as new leaders. Um, as it, anything work as long as everybody's given the same thing to consider. And then they're given some think time. 
then each person is asked to hold up their picture and say how that symbolizes their uh, problem or their journey as a leader. In effect, they are telling their story. It's a good icebreaker, and it draws out people's aspirations and concerns in a safe way. Here is another, um, uh, here's another link to another visual storytelling that invites people to write a movie about how their organization um, survived last year's crisis or what, the, what life is going to be like when the new mission is in place. Um, so I invite you to go and look at those and see how, um, see whether that works for you. I find that it's great for strategy. It's very fun and energetic. And obviously, it's a collaborative experience. So uh, this was a place I was going to pause for questions. Are there more? Hi, Lynn. Um, Valerie's asking if you've ever used tools for animating um, visual representation. Um, Valerie, I haven't. Um, it's, and that's for two reasons. One is I haven't, I need to, to get into tools for that, to make the investment I want to know as a practitioner that I'll be able to pay, pay it off. And I don't know beforehand what it costs. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I can charge because I don't know how much time it'll take. So I don't mean to give you a weasel answer. It's just I don't really know how to scope it. And so I haven't jumped out that window yet without a parachute. But I probably ought to. I'd, like, I'd love to talk to you later if you have and hear what your experiences are. And yeah. Valerie, was that you? Yes, Steve. I, I definitely agree with you. I run into that situation as well. Um, you need to know that you're going to get your investment back. And I, I totally get that. Okay. And I'm going to, uh, Valerie, I'm also going to hit something a little further on. Um, if I didn't accidentally skip it, her. There's a lot of material here, and I, I meet myself coming and going. But there's some research that was done by um, Richard E. Meyer and written up in a book by Ruth Clark and Meyer on the, the criticality of not overwhelming people's working memory by giving them too much to pay attention to. So I think that's still ahead of us, and I will address it then. If I find I've missed it, I'll pass that information on um, along with the slide and the reference after this is over. Okay. So, um, so we've looked at some of any of those big templates um, that I have showed you have been tools for collaboration. We, we often need to get people to collaborate. Um, people who may have different needs and concerns, which may conflict. By the way, this is an part of an illustration that I did for Steve, um, where he was needing to encourage collaboration between business, represented by the well-dressed merchant in green on the left, academia, represented by the gentleman in cap and gown, and the military, who are, and which is a fellow in chain mail on the right. We were using a medieval metaphor at the time. Um, so they often have different needs and concerns, um, and yet you may need them to work together with you to provide feedback on an initiative, to identify problems with a process and uh, recommend improvements, uh, or to make a plan for implementing uh, 
uh, strategy or um, a change that the organization has decided to make. Um, if you've got a bunch of people in the room who all have different ideas about what I have, what ought to be done, you know, it can be like herding cats. A visual template can really help you to corral the issues and build a story that everyone can agree on. And I will particularly go into that when we're talk, um, when we look at a couple of examples for strategy later on, but I'm going to look at a, a small example here. Okay, so here um, we had a conference on culture and change, and the current conference organizers wanted the participants to plan how they were going to use the conference so that they would go home with something of value. Um, and so we started by listing questions to focus the um, to focus the thinking of the participants. Why they came? What did you come here to find? What val why is it important to you? What value do you want to get out? Anything you've found so far, etc. We developed a visual metaphor, which was a treasure hunt. And in this case, um, we just made the template at placemat size so that each person could fill out their own plan. And we gave it to them in the first plenary session and gave them about five or 10 minutes to fill this out. And then we asked them to share in dyads and triads so that they could share ideas, get good ideas from each other, build on their own notes, et cetera. Now, that's what this happens to be. It could be anything. It could be feedback you want to get from a bunch of people about a uh, program you've just piloted. And you know what that can be like when you're trying to get a whole group to give you information at the same time. And often the first person who says anything, everybody says the same thing again. So you can create a template like this. You can put it, create it, Take, that asks the questions you want to ask. Um, you could even change this one. Uh, you're free to use it and say, what treasure did you find in this program? And um, ask your questions. Reproduce it at tabletop size. Put a mug of colored felt pens in the middle of the table and say, have at it, people. Write in your answers. Um, I've then seen... Um, I've seen us uh, put this, uh, put every group, put their template up on the wall and then walk past all the templates looking for ideas to build on, um, things that they particularly agree with or feel are top priority and then harvest and do a major one of these up at the front of the room with harvesting what people think were the most important points from their gallery walk. Another thing I've seen is somebody collecting those templates from the tables and just taking them away as data input and entering it later, particularly if you've just got the people for a very short time and you don't really have time for more of a group process. So those are some collaborative uses. Now, um, these strategy uh, we're going to be looking at some strategy templates. Um, and by the way, what I, what I do not mean to say is go right out there and buy a bunch of growth templates. What I'm saying is this is an organization that thinks visually and that tests it out and have developed tools that have worked well with diverse organizations over a long period of time. That's a place to get ideas. I would recommend not, uh, I, I advocate for not copying their templates directly. You might use the ideas you glean from that to create your own templates, 
Or if you're working for a, an organization that has a budget, they're perfectly reasonable. You might try buying some of them. But I, I just think that uh, they are one of the best examples of using visuals to engage groups and get good information out. So that's what I had to say about that. By the way, um, I'm, I'm going into strategy because all of us belong to, um, to departments that develop their own strategies. And then very often as, a, as a performance consultant or as an OD consultant, you may be asked by um, higher level people in your organization to help facilitate strategic visioning and strategic planning sessions. So these are helpful to do that because um, senior groups can be tricky to manage. Um, okay, so this is a context map. This is a good tool for doing the groundwork that people need to do in order to start strategic planning. It identifies the key, the, the areas that key information can be placed. So you've got the organization there in the center and that underneath it, supporting it, are the customer needs. So you'll list, you'll list it from the group and list what are the big customer needs. Um, then you work outward from the center, filling in what are economic and political factors that you need to take into consideration. What are market trends? What are other trends like technology trends? Um, and then what are uncertainties that have to be dealt with? Once you've gotten all of this filled out, then you've got the... Um, Okay, you're asking the group for the information. The group answers and somebody, the facilitator, actually writes it up on the wall so that everybody's looking at it. You're building a shared picture. By the time it's filled out, they have a the big picture. They have a shared understanding and a context for the strategy that they're going to create. I I think this is an extremely powerful and valuable tool for this purpose. And also, I can assure you, there is a little video on their website on how to fill that one out. Okay, then once the strategy uh, has been prepared, here's another uh, that I find particularly useful that they call their graphic game plan. Once the strategy is developed, you've got to get the wheels on the ground. So this gets the group to identify the pieces of the plan to implement a strategy. First, you start out on the right by filling in what are the goals and the objectives, the top goal in the center and the objectives around, the, around that area. Then on the other end, you identify, well, what are the team, who's the team that has to lead this? What are the resources we're going to have to commit to this? And then in the arrow, it's divided into, um, into quarters. And you would list what are the major deliverables and tasks for those quarters. Underneath where the wheels are, you put in what are the success factors that are going to help us get there. And uh, the bumpy hills underneath are what are some of the challenges we're going to have to overcome. Often, you fill something like this out with sticky notes and then ink it in when the plan's a little more solidified so that you aren't having to cross things out and rewrite them all the time. The result is a, vi a real visual story about what we're going to do, why we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, who's going to do what, uh, what the priorities are. It's a very powerful planning tool. And I haven't covered all of the possibilities, but I have covered all the possibilities that were on the original list. I'm sure you will think of others as you go. So what we're going to do next is look at 
Um, what does research have to say about all this? Okay, are there any quest quick questions before I jump into the research? Mm, no. Okay, then we will go. Okay, um, now a quick truth in advertising, or truth, that's not truth in advertising, it's an announcement of bias on my part. I have found that the the long list of 25 or 30 references at the end of a um, supporting some of these things are not terribly useful. I find in those huge lists little that's applicable to our work. And it's often hard to see the relevance even of the cited article to the article it was cited for. Um, sometimes I think they're just adding stuff that might be relevant. Because if you actually click on them and try to go to it, and uh, I don't have access to a university library, so when I actually read a paper, I have to pay $40 to download it. So I'm not going to do that 40 times. So what I do value is general principles, a list of general principles that can be applied in our work together with a list, a short but pithy list of references uh, to the research that was behind those principles. In other words, go through some of the research extract principles and say where it came from. So I'm not saying don't look at research. I'm saying be selective and don't give 30 references. Um, okay. Now, um, Ruth Clark made a huge contribution to, has made and keeps making a huge contribution to our field because she trolls through libraries of research and extracts usable principles and provides references for them. That's how her books are built. And if you've ever gone to a Ruth workshop, she will actually run some of those studies, uh, experiments with you as the guinea pigs so that you actually experience how it works. It's absolutely wonderful. We'll make a research junkie out of anybody as long as you remain reasonably selective. Okay, so I have loads of visuals, principles, and their references written up in the handout. Uh, the two big sources are um, Malcolm Fleming's wonderful summary of the research in Instructional Technology Foundations, first edition. That is really important that that be the first edition because in the subsequent editions of Gagné's in, um, IT Foundations, that chapter was not included. Um, so dig in the library, find the original one, read chapter nine, photocopy it, whatever you can do to make sure that you have your own selection of it, it's wonderful. Okay, the other thing I point out is um, Ruth and Chapita Lyon's book on graphics for learning. Um, it's a, a wonderful book and extremely practical and very usable in our field. So since visuals are well covered in our handout, uh, in your handout, uh, I'm going to move on to storytelling, which is not quite so easy. I found uh, that the literature does not seem to be rich in well-conducted research on the efficacy of stories um, to support, as to whether they support or don't support, learning and performance. Um, now, there's Lots and lots of articles on who wrote stories, what stories are used for, what is in the stories, but there isn't a whole lot about what changed because the stories were told. This article is a shining exception, and I thank 
My thanks to Dr. Richard Clark for sending it to me. Um, this is uh, Paul Zak. I mentioned him before. He did. Uh, he founded a research organization, and uh, he has found that character-driven stories cause the brain to release oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter, and it signals it's safe to approach others, which motivates cooperation, enhances empathy, and lets us understand how others are likely to react. Um, he recommends also telling employees, and this is going back to um, customer service, uh, well, to orientation, but also to customer service training. Tell employees stories about customers' struggles and how they were solved to arouse empathy and for the, them to feel pleasure at the resolution of, their, of the story. Tell the organization's foundation story based on its transcendent purpose. And he says, repetition of this foundation story will build it into the organization's DNA. Now, it appears to me that this will also improve cooperation and collaboration, although the article does not call that out. So that's my own supposition. Okay. Um, for each of these, I've got the links and the reference so you can read the whole article itself. Okay. Ah, here's what I was concerned about, uh, Valerie and earlier when I couldn't remember where this was. Stories can, act, uh, can suppress or support learning. Um, this, the e-learning and the science of instruction was by Ruth Clark and Richard Mayer, and I really recommend it. And there is also scenario-based e-learning by Ruth and Mayer, Mayer in 2012. And Actually, she's come out with a more recent one, I think 2014, maybe it was even 2015, that does not have Mayer's name on it, but would be an update of the research. Uh, and then finally, scenario-based learning uh, by Ray Jimenez. So I'll say more about that. Okay, the principles are that working memory is a limited resource don't go overboard. Um, developers of e-learning are encouraged to make their e-learning entertaining to attract and retain learners' attention. However, not many who measure e-learning abandonment are also measuring how entertainment factors impact what people understand and remember. Um, Richard Mayer has measured that. Specifically, he has tested lessons with the same content, some of them just plain vanilla with, without any entertainment factors, and some with graphics, sound, and stories to make the lesson more entertaining. Testing showed that learners understand and retain less when the interesting elements don't contribute directly to the learning task. Example, a lesson about how lightning works um, included a story about what happens when lightning strikes a plane. It was very interesting. It was certainly memorable. But testing showed that it distracted people from learning how lightning actually works. So just because it's related does not mean it helps understand how lightning is generated. And he calls this the coherence principle. Hopefully, Steve has beaten you over the head with the coherence principle, and you're already familiar with it. But in case he hasn't, this is a good time to think about it. Uh, I was in L.A. visiting uh, an old, um, my husband and I were visiting an old high school friend. 
who is now a film director, and I, I told him about this, and he reminded me that ad firms in the 80s were making, there was a fad for making ads more engaging and memorable by basing them on popular films and TV shows. So uh, there was one series based on the Pink Panther. Uh, they abandoned that approach when market testing showed that people remembered and talked about the stories, but they did not remember or talk about the brands that were paying for making the ads. So this runs across not just learning, but also advertising and probably performance. Clark scenario-based e-learning um, has full of tools and techniques to develop stories that will support learning without distracting from it. Now, Jimenez, uh, Dr. Jimenez um, hired a Hollywood script writer to teach him how to write compelling scenarios and how to use natural feedback to forward the action and keep it compelling and further improve learning by natural feedback instead of giving people a choice of possible actions and then saying, wrong, try again, um, putting in what would actually happen, like a customer blowing his stack or um, an, an, a coworker becoming angry and uncooperative so that what you're actually providing them is some of the ex virtual experience that would come from making a bad choice. Here was another article, it was very good, and here I want to thank Ryan Watkins for pointing me to this one. Um, and this one's about learning to serve, uh, learning to solve ill-structured problems. Um, and sort of building people's expertise, uh, novices and less experienced practitioners on how to deal with gnarly problems that are hard to recognize, don't have set steps, don't have a set solution, may change constantly while they're working on it, and may require several different strategies. Expert stories about these situations promote understanding and discussion of technical problems. They help learners to frame and grapple with those problems. They can also be used to build group understanding. If you have a group mutually uh, generate stories, it can help them understand each other, understand why other group members behave as they do, and to find different approaches to the issues that they're struggling with. In other words, it's, it st stands as a substitute for firsthand experience. Okay, and finally, uh, final piece of research was establishing relationship. And this is actually a performance one. Um, this was a study on the use of stories to build rapport with the potential buyer. And uh, the Researchers wanted to know what components of a story were successful in establishing rapport. This slide shows you uh, the four major components, relevance, humor, plausibility, and personal, and what the percentage of contribution they had for, uh, to success. Now, I do want to note that this is useful to the analyst to know that Humor will help a lot, but an irrelevant humorous story would be a very bad thing to add to a learning program because, uh, because as the, we learned in the coherency principle, a funny story that is not relevant to the learning objective will actually suppress learning. Okay, so how can you do that? We're going to use a graphic alphabet, and we're going to take a few minutes right now to apply it. So 
I will show you the graphic alphabet and we will use it to develop, uh, to do simple, um, use simple shapes to build simple images. And here is the graphic alphabet at the top of my screen. So grab a piece of paper and a pencil. I recommend that you uh, use unlined paper, um, but whatever paper you've got, turn it landscape style and reproduce those symbols across the top. They don't have to be neat. So circle, triangle, square, um, what we call a parallelogram. It looks like a box that somebody stepped on. A star, it doesn't have to be a correct star with geometrically equal points. We'll never use it in that form anyway. An oval, and what I call the dot and R. Okay, so if I want to draw a laptop, you tell me, what shape should I use? Nobody tells me nothing, ain't nothing going to happen. Probably the rectangle or the square, I would imagine. Okay, rectangle sounds good to me. Um, you see me trying to draw with my finger on my chalk pad. Please ignore the little nail off to the side. Is it a laptop yet? Let's call it a laptop. That's much easier. Uh, so is it a laptop yet? No. Okay. Come on, Valerie. Keyboard. <laughs> okay, what do I, okay, keyboard. So what shape should I use for that? Uh, another rectangle. Okay. Um, Go in the other direction. Yeah, let's see. I'm trying to do the parallelogram and I'm having the devil's own time doing it. Well, only goes to show you. Oh, yeah, that's what I meant to say, parallel, a parallelogram. I'm getting educated tonight. <laughs> okay. Is it a laptop yet? Almost. You need to make little keys. Okay. Oh, do I need to do 47 little parallelograms all neatly lined up? No. Just, a, okay. just dots. Please not. Dashes. A few okay. <laughs> dashes ought to do it. People will understand that's what you meant. Their minds will fill in the difference. Okay. Is it a laptop yet? Uh, no, probably some picture on the screen. Okay. Oh. I'm going to ask to be excused from drawing a picture on the screen and just let me draw the screen. Okay. Because I'm having too hard a time. Okay. Is it a laptop yet? I Looks good to me. I don't know. <laughs> hey, Tara shouldn't be the only person on the hook here. Uh, okay, if, if it is remotely possible that this will be recognized as a laptop, I'd say stop right there because none of the, I, I use what I call the 10 o'clock at night rule, which is it's 10 o'clock at night. You have not yet walked the dog. <laughs> You're, the, you have not yet taken the laundry out of the washer and you need to wear it tomorrow. Draw only what you would draw under those circumstances, because that's probably the circumstances under which you will be drawing. Okay. Okay. So I have a laptop. How can I can how can I turn it into a computer crash? Into a what? A computer crash. I don't know what that means. Oh, how interesting. Okay. Uh, when the computer just goes bluey on you and won't do what you say and gives you a... Oh, okay. I, think, I think the asterisk picture at the end. Okay. <laughs> Works for me. Okay. So I put my dot and aura. And at that point... Oh, I put a hammer. <laughs> 
Suit yourself. I find this easy to draw. <laughs> and I'm all for easy to draw here. Uh, the one thing I will do at this point would be add a label. And that's one of the things from the uh, principles on labels is labeling an image helps people interpret it the way you want it interpreted in the same way. Okay, so here we've got a computer crash. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tiffany, for joining us. Um, all right, how could I? Yeah, okay. How could I uh, draw money to? If I wanted to show, show money. Just a money symbol. Okay. A dollar bill. Ah, so if that would be a little more substantial. So how could I do turn this into a dollar bill? A rectangle. Yep. Good. Okay. And I'm going to get fancy and make it the parallelogram. I have a reason for that. And now we've got a stack of them. So how could I turn that into runaway costs? Uh, put wheels on it. Okay. Yes. Oh, um, yeah, that's good. Okay, fine. I could put a few little zip lines here to show that it's zipping along. And it's too hard to write runaway costs with this little pin, so I'm not going to do it, but I would label the image. Now, you could do other things besides just wheels. You could put little legs under it running. You could put wings on it. You wouldn't want to do all of them. I do you ever do any brainstorming? type stuff with people to get what they perceive yes. you just do this all on your own yes you can do brainstorming with people absolutely um we will do a, a game of dictionary oh yeah oh um now so we've got a crash okay now here's how i draw people I find that the uh, stick person is, is too hard to see. So I do what I call a star person. So I use the little round circle up at the top and then you know, my coordination problem, I um, put four of the uh, rays of the star below. So if I wanted to, oh, let, let me ask. Okay. Oops, come on then. You're a very hefty star person. <laughs> That's cute. Okay, so what have we here? Connection. Okay, yeah. All right, you're jumping to the abstractions right away. We can have connection. We can have a couple, whatever. Partnership. Huh? Partnership. Partnership, you're right. Smiling, happy people holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you intellectual. Um, okay, so if, okay. If I want to make a team, what do I need to do? A T? T team, ma, 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 ma. Oh, sorry. I'm not hearing very well. Oh. Um, okay, sorry. I'll try to be. Oh, you're fine. I guess just add more people. Okay. 
So I'm going to pardon the little minus in this person's face. Um, okay, so is this a team? No. Nope. Why not? You're just one person. Yeah, you're right. I agree with you, but why not? Connection. Okay, yeah. One is isolated. Uh, so how could we turn it into a team? Link them through something. Okay, I agree. So one thing we could do is draw another one in the middle, but I think this is a clever trick right here. All of a sudden, hmm. they are reasonably... Somebody might quibble about the distance of the third person, but we say it's a team. team. They could be team members in, in a little bit of a disagreement. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so how could I show team support? A handoff of something. Okay. Yes. Oh, so how would I draw that? I've given you a poser here. At this point, you have to stop and ask, well, what do we mean by team support? Do we mean somebody supporting the team? Do we mean the team supporting something? Or do we mean the team supporting each other? So if it were somebody supporting the team, we could draw another person down here with their arms uplifted. Oh, yeah. If it was the team supporting something, we could put the three people with their arms uplifted under a line and put whatever it is above the line. Or we could draw the th if it's team supporting each other, then we could draw the three people as a little human pyramid with the uh, two down here. We grow old. Draw this. This is why I hate to give up my iPad for this job. Um, <laughs> so much easier. And then and then label it team support. Okay, so what we've done here is done pictograms which are pictures of things, and ideograms, which are pictures of ideas. Uh, the laptop and the idea of a crash, the person and the idea of team support, or even the idea of team. So you can use those. Oh, I need to move on. Uh, okay, so you can use those to start sketching out ideas. So you've got a handout that has all of this stuff in it. And I'm going to go here to the end. Um, we've talked a bit about uh, creating visuals. Okay, here's a little job aid for planning the story. Uh, so this can help you decide what kind of story do you want to use for your purpose? And uh, if you're trying to get people to understand concepts, here are some possibilities. Oh, nice. If you want them to understand a process, here are some ways of doing it. You have pictures in the slides when you download them. Um, straight procedural tasks here. And applying principles, recommend. Um, using a scenario, and then communicating uh, culture. Here are some things um, like a storyboard showing the hero's journey or a history map displaying the landscape journey, and so on. Once you've decided what you need, if you decide you're going to tell a story in multiple pictures, like a scenario, a comic book, or something like that, then here is a worksheet for thinking through that um, and making sure that the picture you come up with 
helps support the learning intent. So what's the skill being learned? And then what situation would it be? What are the place? What is the characters? And then what decisions must the people make? So you go from here and then you come back here. List the choices you will offer. A best choice, the most com a choice representing the most common error, and a choice that represents the most serious or the second most common error. Once you've got the, situa the place, the characters, and the choices, you can start using your graphic alphabet and adding dialogue. Um, and here, here is, okay, here, here's the scene setting. And then what is, go back, please go back. Um, then what's the new situation if they pick the best choice? So this is designing the feedback piece down here. And I think we have reached the end of my allotted time and spilling over. I, at this point, if uh, you want to sign off, fine. Or if you'd like to answer, uh, ask more questions or whatever, I'd be happy to, uh, to continue the conversation. But I have used up my allotted time. Lynn, we're having audio difficulties. Uh, for some reason, your audio has cut out. <laughs> uh, I guess we've reached a point where we may be at the end of our webinar. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank everyone for being here. Uh, before we go, uh, Tara said, thanks for all the job aids and the worksheets. Very valuable and drawing was fun. Most important, I love that uh, you didn't talk too fast. <laughs> Some <laughs> webinars are hard to follow because they go so quickly. Uh, I could follow you very well. Thank you. Good. Uh, and with that, our webinar comes to an end. Thank all of you for being here. And Lynn, thanks for sharing your expertise and your tools with us. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.